Hi, this is Ed Driscoll. Welcome to the start of the fourth season of Silicon Graffiti. We kick off the new year with a look at old media's response to the horrific shooting on Saturday, January 8th in Tucson, Arizona, which resulted in Congresswoman Gabrielle Giffords being critically wounded, Federal Judge John M. Roll and five others dead, and several people wounded. For anyone who was on Twitter at the time the story first broke, it was quite a sight watching old media's narrative emerge in real time, even before any of the basic facts of the story were known. Concurrent with false early reports that Congresswoman Giffords had been killed were tweets such as this. Mission accomplished, Sarah Palin. And Paul Krugman of the New York Times wasted no time in writing that Giffords was on Sarah Palin's infamous crosshairs list. Krugman added, quote, just yesterday, Ezra Klein remarked that opposition to health reform was getting scary. Actually, it's been scary for quite a while, in a way that already reminded many of us of the climate that preceded the Oklahoma City bombing." Unquote. Crookman's post was timestamped 3.22 p.m. Eastern. It was written very much as the story on the ground was still unfolding, and virtually no facts as to the motive of the shooter were known. Clearly, this was a case of having a political narrative in mind and ready to go, even if it meant bending the facts like a pretzel to make them fit. In fact, once the true details of Gerald Lee Loeffner emerged, it was obvious that this media narrative was nonsensical. A non-political paranoid schizophrenic was inspired to kill because of crosshatch marks and surveyor symbols on a political campaign map? Get real. But this was far from the first time that a narrative was preformed or very quickly assembled in the wake of a shock event. Let's start with the biggie the assassination of JFK in 1963. As James Pearson, the author of the brilliant 2007 book Camelot and the Cultural Revolution, told Peter Robinson of the Hoover Institute, you, you note that James Reston published a column in the New York Times the day after the assassination, which carried the headline, quote, Why America Weeps, Kennedy Victim of Violent Streak He Sought to Curb in Nation, close quote. And so the notion is that somehow the entire country was complicit in the act of Lee Harvey Oswald. Yes, that, uh, that's that, a notion that you write requires yeah. a species of doublethink. Explain your view on that. Well, this appears in the New York Times the day after the assassination, right. November 23rd. It's on the front page. Reston, at the time, is really the dean and the most influential of Lip American Lipman political of his day, right? He was the man. Yes. And in the center of the uh, front page of the New York Times that day, uh, in the center column, there's a long article on Oswald and his communist associations that they have already uh, within 24 hours of the event. So they have all that very quickly. Adjacent to that, however, is the Reston column, which suggests that President Kennedy is a victim of a streak of hatred and violence in the nation. So you have this juxtaposition of the fact President Kennedy is killed by a communist with the interpretation President Kennedy is a victim of American culture. These two things do not jibe. But it was arguably in the decade that just ended when such attempts to force the narrative went into overdrive. Or perhaps it was simply the rise of alternative media, such as blogs and personal videos, um, like this one, that allowed such tactics to be highlighted and occasionally even fought back against. Some pundits believe that it was Hurricane Katrina in September of 2005, above all else, that caused Republicans to lose control over the House and Senate the following year. The media constructed a powerful narrative of Republican negligence, even when facts on the ground pointed towards much more localized malfeasance, such as Mayor Nagin's infamous motor pool of unused buses. As center-left blogger Mickey Kaus, now with Newsweek, wrote in September of 2005 in the midst of Katrina wreaking havoc on the Gulf Coast, Katrina and its aftermath solved a big problem for the anti-Bush media. Quote, Previously, they couldn't grouse about the Iraq War without seeming defeatist and anti-liberationist and maybe even selfishly isolationist. Even the Clintons never figured out a way out of that trap. But nature has succeeded where they failed. It has opened up a way out, at least temporarily. In short, Katrina gives them a way to talk about Iraq without talking about Iraq. No wonder Gwen Ifill smiles the inner smile." Unquote. Having gone all in on their Katrina myths, 
In 2008, the media doubled down even further to elect President Obama. Originally presented as a saintly post-racial Tiger Woods sort of figure, back when Tiger Woods was seen as saintly himself, the sudden appearance of shocking video from candidate Obama's longtime spiritual advisor God damn America! presented a bit of a problem. Fortunately, it was all easily surmountable with just a bit of airbrushing. One week after declaring Reverend Wright's fire-breathing appearance at the NAACP's annual convention was a home run of a speech, CNN tossed the good reverend down the memory hole with then-Senator Obama's approval. If you're ever interviewed by CNN, see if you can get coverage like this for yourself. Senator, it's good to see you this morning. Great to talk to you, John. I, I want to just stipulate at the beginning of this interview, we are declaring a Reverend Wright free zone today. So no questions about <laughs> Reverend Wright. Our viewers want us to move on. So this morning we're going to move on. Is that okay with you? Fair enough. All right. That sounds just fine. <clears throat> the passage of Obamacare on a purely partisan left-wing vote in March of 2010 was accomplished along with this pre-written narrative. You've been this late is here? This is coming out. John yeah. Wilson on the elevator. He comes out as chief of staff. He's with us. It's just three of us walking down the steps. Kill the bill. Kill the bill. Inward, 15 times. How many people were saying that? Maybe out of... How many people out there? 400? Maybe 15 Yeah, very quickly, someone did get the actual video. But last time I checked, Andrew Breitbart still has the $100,000 that he put on the table when no one could come forward with videotaped evidence to corroborate Carson's claims, despite dozens of cameras nearby. Even the left-leaning Politico.com's Ben Smith had to admit to Breitbart, quote, I think you've pretty much won this one, no? But still, the damage was done. A little more than a month after that media-created incident, at the start of May of 2010, one day before Faisal Shahzad was captured on a Dubai-bound plane at JFK Airport as the suspect in the failed bombing of Times Square, New York's Mayor Mike Bloomberg had his own pre-written narrative for the suspect's motive. If I had to guess 25 cents, this would be exactly that. Somebody a who's homegrown. homegrown, maybe a mentally deranged person or somebody with a political agenda that doesn't like uh, the health care bill or something. It could be anything. Funny, though, while it, quote, could be anything, note who actually got named in that clip. Which brings us to Gabrielle Giffords. As Newsbusters.org noted, quote, during MSNBC's live coverage immediately following Saturday's attempted assassination of Congresswoman Gabrielle Giffords, Democrat of Arizona, Correspondent Luke Russert theorized that the shooting was probably a violent reaction to the passage of Obamacare, which Giffords cast an affirmative vote. But a week later, cooler heads began to prevail. Somewhat. The New York Times public editor, quote, shares the view, to an extent, unquote, that his paper rushed to politicize the content. But as he added, quote, to be fair, there were some good reasons to steer the coverage initially in this direction." Unquote. Of course there were. When the media has steered in only one direction for 50 years, why would they change course now? For Silicon Graffiti, I'm Ed Driscoll.